Professor Ramchandra Rao did his B in metallurgy from uh, from this department in 1963, long back. And since then, he has been associated with this department in various capacities. So his latest association was uh, when he used to come here to evaluate the department as uh, on, on behalf of UGC. And I had vivid memories of uh, Professor Ramchandra Rao's uh, comments on each and uh, every lecture. He was uh, he, he talked like an expert of every subject, and that was a very, very special of Professor Ramchandra Rao. He cut across the boundaries of sub-disciplines, and he could talk very, very uh, clearly and with depth about any uh, subject related to material science. Not only material science, also medical science. I, I have a very nice uh, uh, memory, which I will just take a deviation for a minute. He, I, I, one day I, I asked him that, what are you doing now? That time he had retired from, uh, from uh, vice chancellorship of Banaras Hindu University. He told, I am helping CSIR in identifying uh, the Indian medicines. And he told me that, you know, there are, Ashwagandha is a very popular Indian medicine which is used in many, many, uh, to treat many, many diseases. But only one out of eight Ashwagandha varieties has medicinal value. And that really stuck me so much that even now when I go to buy any product with Ashwagandha, I remember him, whether I am buying the right one or not. So that was Professor Ramchandra Rao's uh, very fine uh, grip on all aspects of science. So he was uh, doyen in metallurgy and probably doyen in Indian science. So now uh, it is also my privilege to welcome Professor Cantor, Brian Cantor, in person. Because we had a very nice association with Professor Cantor. Uh, he has visited our department many times and uh, to the extent that he was a member of the committee that evaluated our department a few years back. And he always gave very good suggestions. And uh, I, I must say that me and many of my colleagues have heard first time about high entropy alloy from Professor Brian Cantor himself. So that privilege we have. And uh, I welcome you again. And I, I, I wish what, what uh, Professor Banerjee has told uh, very soon you will come to Bangalore and uh, and we will have a meeting in person. And so Professor Cantor, welcome again. And Thank I you. also welcome all the uh, participants from all parts of uh, the country. And of course, uh, those who have joined from other parts of the world to attend this lecture. This is a very special lecture for us. And now to tell you details about the lecture, I invite uh, Dr. Arvind Sinha, Chief Scientist of NML Jamshedpur, uh, to, to introduce about this lecture. Thank you, Professor Satyam Shabash. And good evening, good morning, and namaste to all the participants of this meeting. And uh, uh, I express uh, again a warm welcome on behalf of the organizers of this meeting, as well as CSIR National Metallurgical, National Metallurgical Laboratory in, in particular. You know that this is the 10th Professor P. Ramchandra Memorial Lecture in the series, but first is of own kind because from this meeting onwards, uh, we are going to be uh, the, the meeting on, on the virtual platform. So we had one last year, but uh, the committee has decided from this year that we will make it on the virtual platform. So in that sense, this is the first meeting and I welcome you all once again. As we know that the, this lecture series is being organized by the friends, students and colleagues of Professor Ramchandra to celebrate his life and, and the teaching. We all know that Professor Ramchandra was among the finest metallurgists and material scientists that India produced in the 20th century. One of the most decorated scientists of India, a fellow of all the Indian academies of science and engineering, a Bhatnagar awardee, 
uh, Professor Ramchandra was not only institution in, in himself, he was a great <coughs> institution builder. Besides serving BHU as a faculty member, he had the honor of being first to be associated with BHU as a student, lecturer, reader, professor, and finally the vice chancellor of this great institution. One, his, his one decade as director at CSIR National Metallurgical Laboratory took the laboratory to the new heights in the fields of metallurgy and material science. Then from a that from BHU, he went and joined defense, the Defense Institute of Armament Technology, and he was the instrumental to make it from to convert it from institute to the deemed university, and he became the first vice chancellor of DIAT Pune. On the research front, he was the pioneer that we all know that he was among the pioneers in the field of rapid solidification, quasi crystalline alloy. Thermodynamics and the metal stable phases was what is main love. But as Professor Satam Suvar says, that for Professor Ramchandra Rao, science has no boundary. He was that cross linker who could gel the different discipline of the science very well together to provide the solution to the worth solving problem. And biomimetics is such a field with the, uh, that Professor Ramchandra Rao started in India and today. This field has transferred through technology to the biomaterial sector in the country. So he was a great person, a perfect man with a scientific brain and a loving heart. So uh, I think you may be knowing that uh, today we are having this meeting when exactly 11 years and six months back, Professor Ramchandra left this physical world. Today is the 10th June. It's 11 years and the six months. Though he has gone physically, but in the subtle form, he will always exist in the heart of his friends and, and his students. With this, thank you very much. So I will ask Professor Vikram Jairam to introduce the speaker of the day. Thank you. Professor. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, can you, can everybody hear me? Can somebody say yes? Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, yes. good. Okay. Yes. It's a, yes, it's a yes. pleasure to introduce Professor Brian Cantor. Um, Brian has had a long and distinguished career in which he has excelled as a scientist, um, a technologist, as an administrator, and finally as a builder of institutions. He, his links to India go back several decades, and many of his personal friends are here in the audience today, and I'd like to welcome all of you and in particular, Brian, for making it possible to have this get together in this lecture today. Um, Professor Cantor is presently Emeritus Professor in the Department of Materials at Oxford and a Research Professor at Brunel in the Advanced Solidification Technology Center. He's been in recent times the Vice Chancellor of the University of York and of Bradford and going backwards in time, the Head of Mathematical and Physical Sciences at Oxford and before that, a research scientist and engineer at the G Research Labs in, in upstate New York. He's been a, a distinguished visiting professor at many institutions across the world, including BHU, Banaras Hindu University, the Indian Institute of Science, Washington State, Northeastern University, and the Kobe Institute. As an institution builder, he's founded and built up the World Technology Universities Network, the UK National Science Learning Center, the Hull York Medical School, and Oxford's Beckbrook Science Park. He's been a consultant for Alcan, NASA, and Rolls-Royce, and editor of Progress in Material Science. He was vice president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and his contributions have been recognized by the award of the CBE from the British government. He's going to tell us about an area that's named after him, and which he should know very well, and which he more or less invented. And this is a new field of multi-component high entropy alloys. So with that, let me hand it over to Brian. We are all looking forward to your lecture. OK, thank you so much. Now I have to work out how to share. I forgot I've got to do that. How do I do that? Uh, you go, go to that arrow pointing up. Wait a minute. No, I've just clicked the right thing. It's coming up. 
screens are just coming up. Can you see my screen? Yes. It's black as at the moment. But, uh... You have to choose the right screen, Brian. I thought I'd chosen it, sorry. Okay. Give me a second. Uh, that looks like a picture of St. Catherine's Oxford. You know, I don't know where that came from. Or maybe, or maybe yeah. Kobe, I don't know. <laughs> it's nothing to do with me. Um, I don't know how to get to the screen itself. We are able to see your screen. My screen now? Yeah, yeah we, can yes, see your, we can yes. see your screen, but it's okay. not on your presentation. No, but it will be in a second. Is that it? Yeah, so yes. you need to go to yeah. full screen now. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, please, good. Please go to full screen. Yeah. Yes, you're on. That's oh, fine. Okay. That's great. Okay. Sorry for the slight hiccup there. Um, look, thank you so much, uh, Professor Suez and uh, Dr. Sinner and uh, uh, Vikram, uh, Professor Jairam, uh, for that wonderful introduction, and Professor Kamania Chattopadhyay, who invited me originally. So all of you for setting this up. Um, as Vikram said, I'm uh, Brian Cantor. So hi to everybody who's joined. I'm privileged and uh, pleased to, to have you all join for my lecture. My name is Brian Cantor. As has been said, I'm uh, currently working partly at the Department of Materials, Oxford University and uh, the Brunel Centre for Advanced Aviation Technology in uh, Brunel University, London. And the talk will be on multi-component high entropy counter alloys. Uh, and before I start, let me say that there are some people attending who are not material scientists, and there are some who, wonder, who are wonderfully expert, way more than me, material scientists. So um, I'm pitching it in a slightly difficult way. Uh, so for those who are experts, uh, please bear with me when I occasionally describe well-known concepts, um, perhaps at a simple level for those that aren't. Um, and uh, for those that uh, aren't specialists, uh, please bear with me occasionally when I lapse into slightly more technological language. I promise not to do either too much. I hope not. Um, OK, so uh, it's my fantastic, wonderful privilege and pleasure to be invited to give this particular lecture um, in uh, honour, in uh, memorial to uh, my long-standing, for so many years, uh, friend and colleague, uh, Pacha Ramachandra Rao. Rao, as I called him uh, all his life. And um, uh, I first met Rao uh, in, 19, uh, in the late 1960s when I was a research student at Cambridge and he came as a visiting fellow. I then worked with him a little bit uh, at Sussex where I went for my first research fellowship in the 70s. And he came again as a visiting fellow. And then he invited me, as has been mentioned, to visit India. And I visited and uh, worked at BHU, Benares Hindu University for a year in 1980. And it was an absolutely transformative experience of my life. Um, I became an internationalist uh, with that trip. Um, and I fell in love with India, of course. Um, and I've been visiting India every ever since, probably uh, once a year ever since, but uh, sadly not last year for reasons you all know about, which we won't go on about. Um, and Rao loved new alloys, so he, he would like uh, what I'm talking about. He loved new materials, there's no doubt about it. We published three papers together. These are the three papers, two in 1977 with Robert Kahn, uh, when we were uh, beginning, for, uh, beginning from the time we worked together at Sussex, and one in 1981, uh, following the, up the work I did with uh, at BHU when I was uh, visiting uh, with him. Uh, now, the paper I published in 2004 on multi-component high entropy alloys, uh, Cantor alloys, uh, has become um, a very uh, hot topic after many, many years when nobody took any notice of it. Um, and the paper in 1981 I published with Rao on the structure of amorphous alloys, I believe is another uh, hidden gem. I like to think that it's uh, still, still no one's taken any notice of it, but I'm hoping that will, that uh, I can persuade people to take notice of it in the future. But that's for the future, and I'm going to be talking today about something which has become uh, a popular topic, which is um, multi-component 
uh, high entropy Cantor elements. And I've got three take home messages. These are them. Human history is the history of new materials. The development of humankind has depended upon new materials. People don't always realize just how crucial this is, and I hope to persuade you of it. Secondly, all materials are alloys. What do we mean by alloys? Alloys means mixtures of other materials, what we call what we might call starting materials. We normally call them, te the techni technical word is components. All materials are alloys. They're made up of mixtures of other materials. And then thirdly, there are gazillions of materials. Gazillions is not, a, not a, a, an accurate technical term, as everybody knows, um, and I will give a more precise definition of what I mean by, by it, but there are really gazillions and gazillions and gazillions of materials, which is uh, something that's been discovered uh, in, in the course of this new field. So the first section of my talk will be about uh, a brief history of materials and a brief history of humankind. And we start three million years ago, which is when the roughly, which is when the first ice age began. And at the same time, it's the beginning of the Stone Age. And it's also roughly at the same time that humans first emerge. Uh, Homo habilis evolves from Australopithecus, the uh, southern apes uh, turn into the early tool using humans. And these events are not, are not disconnected. Um, with the poorer weather, um, it became advantageous for the apes to evolve with bigger brains and to be able to then use tools which was the what the Stone Age means because they began to uh, take stones, uh, flints and things like that from, from that they found and use them as tools. Uh, and, and flints are alloys. And all of the Earth's crust is made up of oxide alloys. And pretty much everything is oxidized at the Earth's crust for the very obvious reason that most things do oxidize and there's lots of oxygen and the Earth's been around a long time. So there's been plenty of time for everything to become oxides. So the Earth's crust is more or less a complicated uh, alloy mixture of oxides. Um, and uh, early humans and uh, the late apes discovered that they could um, uh, shape uh, some flints and stones that they found. They're found materials, they're not really, they're slightly manufactured, they're cleaved to make them into tools. And that allowed them to be able to hunt uh, for animals and uh, cut down plants uh, in, in finding food more effectively. So that all happened three million years ago. And um, we jump forward. We jump forward by almost all of that three million years. We jump forward to the end of the Ice Age, which took uh, place in about 12,000 years ago, about 10,000 BC. And um, that's 99.7% of the time since the beginning of the Ice Age. Most of the time in the last uh, three million years, we've been in the Ice Age. It came to an end uh, 12,000 years ago, and roughly the same time is when the, um, the early Stone Age, the Paleolithic, turns into the Neolithic, the new Stone Age. And it's roughly, and it's also the same time, which is known as the Agricultural Revolution. One of the, the most major events that's happened in humankind's existence. And um, it's sometimes thought to be the biggest event. And um, it's when uh, the, the people stopped uh, going around as nomads in small family groups, hunting and finding food and uh, being peripatetic, um, and began to settle down in villages uh, in far and far, and domesticated animals, they domesticated plants. Um, and this was all because it was the end of the Ice Age and the, the weather was warming up, and it became feasible to do that and to begin to... Uh, um, domesticate animals and have a more a guaranteed source of uh, food, uh, food supply. But you know, there's a material development which is critical to this too. It's the discovery of the firing of clays. People discovered that if you heat clays up, if you take some of the uh, oxide uh, soil, mixes of soils and, and, uh, and, and sands and, uh, and, and uh, uh, clays and, and heat them up with, uh, and, and cool them down, you can shape them into things like pots. Pots are essential to the uh, agricultural revolution because there's no point farming and domesticating your plants and animals if you can't store the food that you get from the plants and the animals otherwise you might you, you know it's going to go off so you, you only have to uh, there's no point in being settled down so actually that agricultural revolution was also driven uh, by the discovery of a new material this time a more manufactured material the ability to fire clay and of course the same technology is used to fire uh, bricks to make our houses out of, and that was also, also part of uh, that change about 12,000 years ago. We jump forward another 6,000 years, and um, we, we have uh, the onset of the Bronze Age. That occurred around about 4,000 BC, 
And it occurred, um, what happened is that uh, the kilns that people use and the small fires that people use to uh, 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 fire uh, clay uh, pottery, um, from time to time would be based on um, suitable uh, metal ores and a process called smelting occurred. It was discovered almost certainly by, by accident. Early uh, uh, Stone Age people must have been amazed to discover at the bottom of their fires to see metals oozing out at the bottom. Because if you heat an oxide, say a copper ore, um, a copper oxide ore, in the presence of carbon, and if you have a fire, you make it out of wood, and that's got carbon in it, and then the carbon oxidizes, uh, sorry, reduces, uh, re deoxidizes the oxide back to the metal. It's called smelting, and it's how most, uh, most materials are nowadays still made, by smelting. Um, and at first, these uh, metals were not really uh, much use because metals are very, very soft. And not everyone knows this, but um, metals are intrinsically are pretty soft and copper and, uh, and, and gold and, uh, and tin and uh, lead, the early metals uh, could be beaten, in, uh, but they weren't uh, very good uh, for the sort of uh, purposes we use them nowadays. Um, and they were used just for decoration. But then someone discovered if you add a little bit of tin to uh, copper, you get bronze. Uh, this couldn't have happened naturally. Copper and tin don't really occur together, copper and tin oxides, copper and tin ores. But um, it must have been uh, discovered uh, by some trial and error process. But if you add a few percent of tin to copper, you get a much stronger material and you can now shape it much more effectively than you can with firing clay uh, materials because you can cast uh, metals like bronze and you can uh, work them uh, by hammering them. And so you can have a much wider range of uh, uh, shapes but you can also get much stronger materials. So you have much better tools. And so the Bronze Age began. This led to the growth of um, trading. It led to the growth of business. It led to the growth of cities. It led to the growth of governments to control all these things. It led to the growth of empires. And all the, the famous uh, ancient empires grew up at this time in the Bronze Age. The, the, the pharaohs in, uh, in Egypt, uh, the Minoan civilization in Crete, um, the, uh, the, uh, the earliest um, uh, Chinese civilizations, the Mayan civil uh, empires, the, the, China, the Mayan civilization in Central America, and so on and so on, the Hammurabis in, in Babylon, and so on. All based on this much stronger material which allowed uh, this development. And we jump forward another three or 4,000 years to the end of the second millennium BC, around about 1500 BC, and um, the kiln technology, the firing technology, the, the furnaces being used were improving. Um, and essentially uh, the biggest improvement was to put a chimney on the fire and you get hotter fires. And it, it turned out you could now, people didn't know this, they discovered that they could uh, smelt um, even stronger metals, mainly, most importantly, iron. And we move into the iron age because iron has a much higher melting point than copper. So, uh, uh, it was possible then to begin to smelt iron from iron ores, from iron oxide ores. Now, iron is different from copper because uh, it absorbs the, some of the carbon, which is uh, being doing the smelting. So you end up with iron with a few percent carbon. And the Iron Age consists of cast irons and wrought irons, hammered irons, um, which are much stronger and much more uh, uh, usable tools even than the bronzes, which were being used before. There's a total collapse of all those civilizations. It's called the Great Collapse at the end of the second millennium BC. Uh, all of those civilizations collapse suddenly. The Hittites discover iron uh, uh, the technologies first. They keep it quiet for a little while, but then it diffuses out. And we see the growth of, of new uh, massive empires, the most notable one, of course, being the Roman Empire, which grew on the basis of that. But the, the real beginning of China begins with the Iron Age, when the Qin uh, a dynasty uh, takes over from the previous uh, um, uh, ones and really unifies everybody to create the creation of China begins with the Iron Age. And um, so the Iron Age, a massively important event again. Well, let me show you a couple of uh, pictures rather than just have me talking. Um, here's an older one, flint chopping tool from about 2 million years BC, um, found in the Horn of Africa in the Older One Gorge. Here's a picture of a bronze dagger from Cyprus, uh, about 1500 BC, at the beginning, uh, towards the end of the Bronze Age. Uh, it's green because it's slightly oxidized. Here you can see, um, uh, let me just get the pointer. 
that's better. Here you can see a, a, a copper a copper heath hearth of a fire that was used for smelting copper. It's not, not much more than just what you might have at a campsite. Um, and then as the technology got better, you started to have chimneys on, on the above the fire. And this is a, from a, a picture on a Greek vase showing a blacksmith taking iron an iron bloom uh, out of the uh, bottom uh, in order to hammer it into a useful uh, object. Um, well, we jump forward again to the 18th and 19th century and jump forward another few thousand years. Um, and we move to the Industrial Revolution, the second really major change in how people lived. The first is thought to be the Agricultural Revolution, the second, the Industrial Revolution in the 18th and 19th century. And of course, what it's about is the ability to manufacture things in large quantities. Industrial manufacture be, be, begins, we get the initially in the, cop, in the, um, in the cotton industry with uh, textiles, textile mills and uh, woolen mills. And then we get printing presses and then we get uh, factories making all sorts of things. And we begin to get, uh, as we move into the 19th century, we begin to get uh, uh, electricity being uh, uh, discovered and uh, electricity distribution and power stations. We get bridges being built and, uh, and uh, roads being built, uh, ships and uh, transport with ships and, uh, and trains. And then obviously later, towards the end of the 19th century, we get cars. And into the 20th century, we get uh, planes. So the massive uh, developments of technology, but on a, all based around manufacturing capability, but all based around the development of another really new material. Maybe you could say it's a tweaked up material, steel. Steel is not really made properly until the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And uh, as uh, many people in the audience know, iron carbon ions uh, have more carbon in them. They're less pure than steels and steels are a a reduced form of, uh, of iron that you, 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 you oxidize back out some of the carbon. So instead of having a few percent of carbon, you have point a few percent, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, up to about 0.8 percent of carbon in steels. And it's a much more uh, usable material in the sense that it combines that ability to, to have forming capability, which I mentioned already, uh, which all metals have because they're relatively soft, together with the hardness and strength and by controlling that carbon, you get uh, wonderful new materials which drive uh, and underpin uh, the Industrial Revolution. Well, uh, I'm going to um, just mention in passing, really, jet engines. Uh, jet engines were discovered in the, uh, uh, and invented in the 1930s. Uh, Frank Whittle proposed jet engines to uh, the Ministry of Defence in the UK. Uh, another famous material, sci famous material scientist, uh, Griffiths, uh, assessed it and, and ruled it out. He said, it's never going to work. It was ruled out. They said it'll never work. There's no materials hot enough uh, to withstand the temperatures that will be generated in a jet engine. By uh, a considerable irony, um, the very same year that, that the jet engines were ruled out by the Ministry of Defence, um, nickel superalloys were patented. Nickel superalloys, which are the material that solve the problem. They are nickel, uh, as, uh, as is obvious, with a little bit of aluminium and titanium added to give it better strength. Nickel is a high temperature material which could withstand the the temperature. And of course, if we jump forward to the uh, modern times, we're in the middle of the third biggest revolution in how people live, the information revolution. Computers, telecommunications, satellites, uh, artificial intelligence, the internet, uh, all these things which we know, the reason we're able to even have this meeting virtually. So they all depend upon silicon chips, and silicon chips are silicon, uh, complicated uh, engineered uh, objects but made out of uh, um, silicon uh, semiconductors, which are silicon doped alloys. They're micro alloys, tiny little uh, additions to silicon as a semiconducting material uh, to control its electrical properties. But they are alloys again. So just a quick, some quick pictures of these things. Here's uh, Damascus steel knives, very beautifully made um, with these beautiful uh, patterns. The patterns arise from the alternating layers. This is at the relatively high level of about 0.8% carbon, relatively high level. And these are alternating layers of pure iron, which gives the softness and the formability into these shapes. And the carbide, iron carbide cementite, which are the other layers, the other colored layers, uh, which then, when, when uh, made into the object, give these beautiful pictures. These are at the, the higher carbon end, which means they're relatively strong and less uh, shapeable. At the low end, at 0.05 and 0.1% carbon, you get a very shapeable material, but which can still be very strong and makes these wonderful so-called golden era cars in the 1950s, the wonderful Cadillacs and things that were made 
uh, but at the height of the, of the zenith of the uh, car industry. Here's a jet engine, the GE90, uh, one of the biggest jet engines in the world. I worked at GE, as uh, uh, Vikram mentioned. Um, and blades rotate here and suck the air in, which then gets uh, compressed. And then the fuel's burnt and it's heated. And the hot blast then strikes uh, the turbines, which rotate, which make the whole engine work. And, the, uh, and then exit at the, at, the, at the end, which drives the plane forward. It's my simple explanation of how jet, a jet engine works. And the, the material that makes this happen is, is because the temperatures are so incredibly hot, as Griffiths uh, quite rightly said, is uh, nickel, which is the background uh, material here, uh, with small particles of, well, biggish particles of aluminide from a small addition of uh, aluminium to provide the strength. A bit like the cementite and iron, you've got the base metal, which is in many ways quite soft and, and ductile, which allows the material to not fracture, but at the same time, it has these hardening uh, uh, compounds which uh, which which uh, give it its strength and then finally some pictures of uh, silicon technology here's a 200 millimeter diameter high purity silicon single crystal this is a wonder of modern technology that you can grow a, a, a an incredibly high purity it's parts per million level purity a single whole single crystal of silicon they're nowadays made in uh, in sizes up to four or even five times as big as this um, and then these are cut into thin discs here's a thin disc you can buy this disc, it's, I took the picture from the web, I could have bought one for $40. It consists of literally hundreds of uh, individual silicon chips. Each of these little squares is a silicon chip, and each of those silicon chips has within it literally thousands of components. Each one of those will be at the heart of uh, the computer I'm looking at right now, or your computer, um, or, and lots of other technology too. And here's a, an image of what it looks like. This distance is about 10 atoms, and each of these different regions is doped is alloyed, microalloyed, with uh, slightly different amounts of nitrogen or boron or something like that to give the different electrical uh, properties and the combination of these then build up to give the wonderful uh, capabilities that we know about. So that's the end of the first section of my talk. I wanted to persuade you that humankind's development was uh, based on the development of materials. Most material scientists know this, but I'm trying to persuade them to know it better and stronger so that they uh, strut even even taller than they already do. Um, and I, if you're not a material scientist, I'm trying to persuade you about the importance of material science and the materials. Um, and of course, I've also tried to persuade you in my second contention, which is that all materials are actually alloys. They're mixtures of other materials. Now, what happened at the end of the 1970s and early 1980s when we invented multi-component high entropy alloys and uh, later they acquired the name Cantor alloys? Some of them did. Well, I noticed towards the end uh, of the 1970s that um, all of our materials and alloys have been made by what I call a conventional alloying strategy. And that's to say, this wasn't done necessarily by, really by design, it was done almost uh, sort of naturally it grew up, but we pick one major component for the main property we want, and then we add small amounts of additional elements for secondary properties. I've already given you examples on nickel super alloys, and nickel is selected because it's a high temperature material, but we had to discover if you add a bit of aluminium, it strengthens it and actually you have a bit of chromium added to make it uh, corrosion resistant as well. But to take a completely different example, if you take window glass, uh, we use uh, silicon dioxide because silicon dioxide can be heated up and cooled down and become amorphous and therefore transparent, um, but it's quite hard to melt. So we add a bit of sodium oxide to make it more, uh, to, to ease the manufacturing process. Uh, I've already mentioned bronzes, uh, we take our copper, which is quite soft, but we add a bit of tin and the copper tin compound, which forms, uh, gives it hard, hardness and strength. So this is this and this we find everywhere. The silicon is basically uh, um, a semiconductor, which gives us its basic electrical properties. But then we tweak them up to give different kinds of electrical properties by adding tiny amounts of nitrogen and boron and aluminium. <clears throat> this is conventional alloying strategy. And I was going around at the late 1970s while I was still at Sussex University saying, why do we never do what I call multi-component alloying strategy? Take large numbers of components in equal or near equal proportions. And I went round and let me explain what I mean first and then, uh, then give you the answer to why we don't. Um, because I got told the answer pretty quickly. But what do I mean? Well, for those that aren't material scientists, we, we explain uh, a three component system, a, a, a material made out of three 
different starting materials, we, we picture eyes on a, what's called a ternary phase diagram in a triangle. So we put one of the components at each of the corners, A, B and C. It could be nickel, aluminium and chromium. And all compositions made up of those three components are represented by a point somewhere in this uh, triangle. If you start at pure nickel and walk along this direction, we get nickel aluminium alloys. If we walk along this direction, we get increasingly concentrated chromium alloys, nickel chromium alloys. If we walk into the middle, we get a mixture of aluminium and chromium being added to the nickel. Well, what I was saying was um, most of our materials are in the corners of a phase diagram like this. They consist of one component with a bit of some other stuff added. Usually one or two components added, not very often more than one or two. Um, and the middle region, which is where most of the materials actually are in this three component system, in this three component, in the range of three component materials, have not usually been looked at. We don't know much, even now, about many ternary systems. We don't know much about them. We know a bit about some, but we don't know much about any. And if we go to a, a four component system, go from a triangle to a tetrahedron, a four pointed a polyhedron instead of a three pointed, the triangle is a three pointed polyhedron. This is a four pointed polyhedron. Well, if we go to a four component system, A, B, C, D, this might be nickel with some aluminium and chromium um, with a bit of iron added. Maybe we find that's, uh, that's advantageous or a bit of rhenium, which we know is, is advantageous. And then in the middle of this uh, region, we definitely know nothing about it. The vast majority of four component systems, four component materials, nobody's ever looked at, at all, and most of the most of them anyway, of four component systems, four component materials. And if we have done, we've only looked down in these corners here in the blue regions that I've shown you. And if we go to five components, six components, seven components, well, forget it. We know almost nothing about those. So that was my question. Why do we never do it? And I got the answer very quickly because everyone told me, you're bonkers, Brian. You're daft. You're crazy. This is a daft idea. Of course, we don't do it because when we, if we and the reason I think is because and if you start trying to add more components, at first you find it's quite difficult to make the materials. We now know that that isn't true generally. Most big, most multi-component materials are very easy to make, just as easy as um, as, uh, as uh, materials with one or two or three components. So multi-component materials are actually generally quite easy. But as we move away from these corners, at first it gets a little bit difficult and it gets a bit harder to make the materials. So people have been rather frightened of it and didn't do it and therefore never went into the middle of the uh, phase, what's called the phase space. So in multi-component phase space, as I call it, or a multi-component phase diagram, we can we can have six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We can have more, you'll see in a, in a minute, uh, uh, components. And you have to imagine, we can't draw it, a multi-component uh, polyhedron within which the space is all the materials we could make. So we could have ten components. It's what's called a hyperpolyhedron. You can only draw it in hyperspace, um, but we can imagine that you could uh, generalize this, and in the central region would be where all the materials are, but we've never ever studied any of them or looked at them. So that's what people tell me it was daft, it was bonkers. And I couldn't get any fun, any research funders to give me money to study it, and I couldn't get any, any research students or, res or, 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 or uh, research fellows to study, it, study uh, this idea. Because very reasonably, they, the research funders said we want to study something that's going to lead to useful materials, and the uh, and the research fellows and research students, potential ones, said they wanted to have uh, careers, they wanted to get jobs, so they wanted to work on things that other people were working on. So they didn't want to work on daft ideas that somebody uh, had that weren't going to go anywhere. That's what they thought. Finally, I persuaded. Uh, I can't see it anymore because there's something on my screen, but down in the bottom, you can see here. Uh, Alan Vincent's name, I persuaded a young student, Alan Vincent, it was actually just as I came back from India, from BHU, uh, to have a go at this. I, Alan was a really nice young man. He was never going to be a scientist, but he was a, a bit of a lad about town and he was a bit uh, free and easy wheeling, easy going, free, free wheeling. And he said, OK, I'll have a go at this. No, uh, and I fortunately persuaded him to do it. And um, it was because of that uh, he was so free and easy. Uh, uh, had such a free, easy, uh, good nature that he, he did it. Uh, you'll see that also led to a slight problem. But the first material we made up was this one. It's a 20 component alloy. Uh, we, we didn't know where to start, so we just picked pretty much everything we could find that we could mix up together. 20 different components, chromium, manganese, iron, et cetera, et cetera, 5% of each. Um, 
and it looked like this. We uh, took some pictures of it in a microscope, optical microscope. We took some uh, X-ray diffraction traces of it. It was fairly brittle, um, and we thought, and it's a mess. It's a it's a mess of a material. It's it's, it's a complicated material. I'm not sure we'd learn very much, except that there are some very complicated materials, which you probably would have expected, I suppose. Um, but we then found something very, very interesting. This region here, these regions here, these black regions, are what is now known as the Cantor alloy, the original Cantor alloy, the first Cantor alloy. The first Cantor alloy is, consists of chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, five components in equal proportions, 20% of each. 20% chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. And amazingly, nobody would have predicted it. I'll say why in a second. It turned out to be single phase, phase-centered cubic. Nobody would have predicted that. So let me explain for those who aren't material scientists what phase-centered cubic means. It means the atoms are arranged like this, uh, an atom at the corner of a, each corner of the cube and an atom in the, each phase center, fairly obviously. If And this is the structure that many of those soft metals have, pure uh, copper is face centered cubic, pure nickel is face centered cubic, pure gold is face centered cubic, pure lead is, pure aluminium is. And it's because of that that they have this softness and this ability to be deformed and also this resistance to fracture. It's because in this structure, the atom planes can roll over each other rather easily. And so you can get a change of shape in the material rather easily without it fracturing. So they're resistant to fracture and they can also be shaped very easily. And it's because of this structure. But if you start adding other components to it, it dis the structure doesn't stay like that, unfortunately. If you take your copper, pure copper, and you add a bit of tin, well, up to about um, a percent of tin, maybe one in a hundred atoms, the tin atoms just replace at random one in a hundred of the copper atoms. But anything more than that, and it forms a compound, a copper tin uh, compound, which is what gives the hardness. If you do the same thing with nickel, you can add aluminium to nickel, as we've already talked about. And about one in a thousand, a smaller number of aluminium atoms can replace nickel, one in a thousand at random on this, and any more than 0.1% of aluminium. And you start to form those nickel aluminide particles, which are what give the strength to the nickel superalloys. And the copper tin compound gives the strength to the uh, co copper tin bronzes. Um, now, nobody would have predicted this material would would be a single phase, phase centered cubic material. What does it mean? It means that in this case, 20%, all of the atoms have the single structure here. There's no compound formed. And 20% of these atoms at random are chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. In rec very recently, it's been demonstrated and shown they are almost completely, absolutely random. There is, not, there is no what's called short range ordering. And so they really are very randomly distributed. It's what's called an ideal, uh, an ideal solution very close to being that. Um, nobody would have predicted it because of these five components, nickel is the only one that's face centered cubic, has this structure at room temperature. And in general, we don't get such extended uh, alloying with a single structure. We now know that actually in multi-component phase space, in multi-component materials, there are literally massive amounts of single phase fields. There's an enormous number of single phase face centered cubic um, materials, and there's an enormous uh, uh, area of single phase body centered cubic materials. And there's an, an every single crystal structure we know about has an enormous sea of multi component solution region where the atoms uh, are randomly distributed across the uh, structure in the way I've described for the Cantrell. But this was the first one that was discovered, and it was really quite a shock. Now, let me go back to the the story with Alan Vincent. So he, he wrote up his thesis uh, and uh, it, he did a, an okay job of it, but it wasn't a super job. It was good enough for him to get uh, a moderate uh, result. He got his degree and he left. He was never going to be a scientist. Uh, I've been in touch with him recently. He's working as a, a manager for, for an aerospace company um, in sales um, and, uh, and, and other things. Um, unfortunately, the work he did um, was in, good enough for his thesis, but it was nowhere near good enough to be published in a um, in a journal, uh, which has high standards of the quality of the data that you've got to have developed. And uh, um, if I tell you his thesis was handwritten, it'll give you an idea. Um, so it wasn't publishable. Now, it was, now at that time, I'd just come back from India, um, but I also left shortly after that to go and work at GE for a year. And then I came back to Oxford and while, uh, to become a lecturer at Oxford. And while I was 
a GE. I got the bug for being an applied scientist. I, I got the bug for not being a pure scientist anymore, which I've been pretty much up until then, but for being an applied scientist working on really big applied projects, which I'd worked on at GE. And I did that pretty much the whole of my uh, 20 years at, uh, at, at, at Oxford. So I, I stopped thinking so much about uh, this, this rather fundamental, uh, rather crazy idea that nobody would fund anyway. Um, but I kept an eye open. And finally, uh, about 15 years later, in the mid 90s, I persuaded another undergraduate student, um, Peter Knight. I kept suggesting it to people, but they still wouldn't, weren't interested and I couldn't get any funding. But finally, Peter Knight, another very nice young man again, um, uh, uh, agree to, to repeat the experiments and see if we could do, uh, do, get the same kind of experiments. Um, so here, someone else has started sharing. I don't know what's happened. Can you still see my screen? Uh, no. no. Who, who is this sharing? Uh, can they stop sharing? Hello? No, we are not able to are not able to hear you, Brian. Uh, Sorry? Uh, Brian, can you just share again? Uh, OK. Hold on a minute. I need to get out of this so I can get into the right screen. Somebody else is sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, can you can 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 you stop Some, sharing the screen? Whoever is sharing the screen, please. Yeah. It's Thanks. someone called uh, Dilson Santos. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we are it's back fine. now. We're back. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry uh, about okay. that. Sorry about that. Sorry about Good. that. I don't know what happened. Um. Yeah. Okay. So um. OK, so I uh, so I was explaining. Uh, sorry, I'll go just go back a second. Um, so I was explaining that um, I persuaded another young man called Peter Knight to repeat the experiments, but history repeated itself. The same thing happened. He did. A, he was again a nice young guy. He did a good job uh, for his own uh, dissertation. He got his degree just like Alan. He got a um, he got a third class degree and left and went off uh, to be to, to have a, a career somewhere else. He was never going to be a scientist. And but we still couldn't publish. So finally, in desperation, I turned to my postdoc, Isaac Chang, a long standing colleague of mine, now a professor at Brunel, and said, look, Isaac, for heaven's sake, repeat these results and we can publish and it will be a great, a nice paper. So we finally he did that. He did a nice job. We presented at a, a conference in 2002 and it was published in 2004 and it promptly died a death. Nobody was interested. Now, around about that time, I went into the third phase of my career. I'd been a pure scientist until at Sussex and at Cambridge. I was a, an applied scientist at GE and at uh, Oxford. And then uh, I became a university administrator. I became head of science at Oxford. And then I became vice chancellor at uh, York and then Bradford. And I did that until about a year or two ago when I stepped down. I've gone back to being a, a scientist again. Um, and I, again, my eye was off the ball. I wasn't concentrating on it, but nobody was interested anyway. So uh, it didn't move forward. Now, unbeknownst to me, Professor Jin Wei Ye, now a very good friend of mine, who is a, a professor at the National Tsinghua University in, Ch in uh, Taiwan, had the same idea as me in the mid 90s. And he began studying it and he began doing some work on it. And he published his first paper in 2004, the same year as we published Isaac Chang, uh, Vincent Knight and myself published our paper. So the two seminal papers in this field are in 2004. They both died a death. He had the same issue. Lots of people said to him, this is a crazy idea. Why would we be interested in this? But he pursued it. And he had, unlike me, at that time I didn't have a permanent job. So I wasn't in a good position to pursue it. Um, but he did have a good job and his funders supported him. So in the end, uh, he kept working on it. So now those two papers had no more than eight citations, eight references in the first two or three years after they were published. Nowadays, they get thousands of citations every year, and there are literally thousands of papers being published on the, in, in, in this field every year. It's become a very hot topic. So I was working as vice chancellor at the University of York, and suddenly, in the early 2010s, 
I began to get people ringing up to me and saying, uh, what are these new materials that you've uh, you invented, Brian? Um, can you come and give a talk about the, the latest developments? And of course, I wasn't in touch with it. So I had to go back and get back in touch with it pretty fast. But I got to meet uh, Jingwei Ye, who's now a very good friend of mine. And uh, we, we, we uh, haven't met him, uh, of course, the last year or, or two for obvious reasons, but I'm looking forward to seeing him uh, uh, hopefully later this year or next year when hopefully things will get back together again uh, for the same time when I visit India. Well, that's the story of what happened. Um, but why were people suddenly so excited? Well, the reason, the main reason is this, the counter alloys, and this is what the counter alloy uh, looks like when it's... Um, Oh, my pointer stopped moving. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, my pointer stopped moving. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, the uh, let me see if I can. Yeah, it's been moving. Oh, it's, it's all right. It is now. No, it was, I've managed to reactivate it. So this is uh, what the Cantrale looks like if you take it and. Um, uh homogenize it and uh just do general stuff to turn it into a normal material it's a series of crystals uh, these are individual crystals with different orientations but each one is single phase phase centered cubic uh, as i said uh, these are two alloys one's the cantor alloy itself here the 20 percent uh, of each of these this is what's called a modified cantor alloy it's a different cantor alloy again single phase phase centered cubic uh, but with a slightly different composition of the same five components and that's shown over here. Um, this material looks almost exactly the same as a face-centered cubic copper or a face-centered cubic gold or a face-centered cubic lead material might look. Um, but the exciting thing is that when you put it under a uh, stress, if you uh, stress it, the stress strain curve looks like this. So for most materials, as the material scientists in the, uh, attending know, um, if they're metals, they're soft, which means they don't go to a very high level here on the stress axis, and then they extend for a very long way. If you choose, however, a, 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 an oxide or a ceramic um, or a very high strength material, usually it then goes up very high here, but then it fractures and you don't get much extension. You don't get much formability and you don't get much resistance to fracture. What the, the, the holy grail for material scientists in strength and mechanical properties is to be able to have a high uh, capability and high strength on this axis, but also have high extendability on this axis. And the cantor alloys show that, and all of the FCC alloys do. In fact, it turns out that they're the best. So here's what's called an Ashby map, a fracture toughness, a resistance to fracture and strength. And here are different materials, polymers, uh, oxide, glasses, ceramics, and so on, me different metals, high strength steels. Here are the high entropy alloys right at the top with the best fracture resistance and as good uh, uh, yield strength as 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 uh, as as uh, and better uh, and better nowadays and than even the best and in fact if we do this plot here this is slightly more up to date um, then the, these are all the different steels and these are the um, canter uh, the uh, FCC canter alloys and you can see now a lot of the different compositions all sorts of different you can get different compositions you can have different components you have different uh, percentages of each of them and still be in the single phase phase centered cubic region where you have uh, the, the, this, particular this particular set of special properties. And um, this is the uh, uh, formability, the, 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 the amount that you can uh, stretch the material, and this is the strength. So you can see they're well above all the very best steels. Uh, and another point to notice, though, is that there's an awful lot of them. As I said uh, already, there's a massive C in the middle of that multi-component phase space. There is a massive C, a massive region full of millions and millions and millions of different uh, cancer alloys, face centered cubic alloys with different compositions. We've only just begun to look at a few of them, to be perfectly honest, and you can see they have a range of properties, but in broad terms, you can get from the cancer alloys already um, strengths in the half to one and a half gigapascals along here, and uh, ductilities and fracture and elongations in the range 50 to 100% which are really outstanding uh, ranges. And we haven't really optimized them yet. Now, Murti uh, and Ranganathan and Ye published the first book in 2014 on the topic, and they showed three pages of Cantor alloy. 
which had been discovered at that point. Those are the three pages. They did an update in uh, about two years ago, and they're now five times as many. And there are still literally millions, millions more cancer alloys which have not even been investigated. And almost none of them have been optimized. We're seeing uh, great improvements in strength every time somebody uh, tries a different method of improving the materials. But more importantly, the cancer alloys are only one example of a big region of interest in multi-component phase space. The biggest uh, discovery, which we made in the late 70s, early 80s and published in 2004, was of this enormous wealth of new materials and, and materials that are available. I'll say how many in, in, in a minute. But um, Dan Miracle and Oleg Senkov, who, uh, who, who, oops, who come from um, the Wright-Patterson uh, base in... Um, in uh, the Wright-Patterson Base uh, Air Force uh, Research Center in um, in Ohio, uh, wrote a, an influential review paper in 2017. They said then that we had discovered eight different families of high entropy alloys, of multi-component alloys, or multi-component materials of interest. And they said, we've only just scratched the surface. Well, the truth is, the counter alloys is one of those, and we've only just scratched the, the surface of the counter alloys. And there is a field of body centered cubic uh, alloys called the Senkov alloys. There is a field of uh, perovskites. There is a field of um, uh, oxide material. There is a field of, uh, of, 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 uh, of mono boro nitro carbides. A massive field uh, of each of these materials which is available to be investigated. Eight have been discovered by 2017, probably more now. And each of those we've hardly really begun to look into to optimize. So the question arises, how many materials um, are there? How many materials could we actually make? Well, this depends upon two numbers. The number of components we can use, the number of starting materials we can have, and how different a material has to be, its composition has to be, X, before it becomes a different material. That's called the material specification. And um, if you have, uh, that means that if you change the, co the comp composition by X percent of one of the components, then you've moved to a different material. If you, if that's the case, if let's say X was 1%, then it means that would be, and N is 100 over X, there will be 100 over X composition values for each component. If X is 1%, there'll be 100 different points for each uh, component. Well, if C is the number of components we can start with and X is the specification with N associated with it, it turns out the number of different materials you can make, the number of different separated points within that uh, triangle or that tetrahedron or that uh, hyperpolyhedron of uh, C, C pointed hyperpolyhedron is given by this combinatorial formula. You don't need to understand what the formula is, um, uh, I, but I can just show you the results. Let's ask the question, though, how many components do we have? Well, there are 180 different elements, but quite a lot of those are radioactive uh, and some of them uh, are completely unreactive, the noble gases. If we strip those out, we come down to about 80. There's about 80 components we could be used, but I'm going to choose a slightly more conservative number, 60. It, th there's almost certainly more components that we can use to make materials, but 60 uh, will do us for a moment. You'll see why in a second. And we're going to choose X as 0.1%. Now, most materials are specified a uh, good engineering materials to about 0.1 percent some are specified uh, less less well-defined materials to one percent but most are specified uh, actually even more than 0.1 percent and some like silicon semiconductors and uh, uh, the high strength steels often components are specified to parts per million which is much more accurate than this but let's choose 60 and 0.1 in which case the number of materials we can make is 10 to the 100 10 multiplied by itself 100 times, that's called a Google. Um, and that's why I chose these numbers because it gives, uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly how many we could use. It's a very fairly conservative number, so there's probably even more materials than this. Or if you want to be a bit niggardly, you could say, well, some of these we couldn't probably make. So maybe you want to be more conservative. If you choose C equals 40 and X equals 1%, which is unbelievably conservative, this is still 10 to the 30 there's still a massive, massive, massive number of materials that can be made. How massive? Compare it. There's 10 to the 66 atoms in, in the galaxy, our galaxy, the Milky Way. There's 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. That's the current estimate. 
and the size of the universe is 10 to the 34 nanometers across. It, the number of materials is more than the number of atoms in the galaxy. It's even more than the number of atoms in the universe that exist. It's a phenomenal number. Within that phenomenal number, in that multi-component phase space, in that, in that C-pointed hyperpolyhedron, there are great big areas of Cantor alloys. There are great big areas of Senkov alloys, BCC alloys. There are great big areas of, um, of, of uh, spinel, of a spinel structure with a single phase. There's great big areas of others. And in between those, there's great big areas of multi-phase materials. Most of them still not even looked at, uh, hardly, hardly studied. The total number of known materials I estimate, and this is a generous estimate of being maybe a trillion, it's probably about uh, a factor of 10 lower than that, uh, or 100 lower than that, but let's be generous and call it a trillion. It's still an absolutely minuscule amount of the total. Now, what about this term high entropy? So I don't want to overdo the maths here, but uh, most material scientists will know that the structure of a material depends on its free energy, G, and that depends upon a balance between two competing forces, the enthalpy H or the energy H, which depends upon the chemical interactions in the material, and the entropy S, which depends upon the disorder in the material. So this is a very generalized uh, issue that, uh, the, that what actually happens in the world depends, so G, the free energy of mixing of the components, depends upon their interaction, the energy interaction. If they bond together, that means that it lowers their energy, and everything in the world wants to lower its energy. There's an enormous force trying to do that. But that is balanced by a second, completely different force, which was discovered in the 19th century, of course, by the early thermodynamicists, the entropy, the disorder, the randomness of the material. And everything wants to increase its randomness. Everything wants to uh, lower its energy. If you drop something, it falls to the floor because it's lowering its energy. Uh, on the other hand, if you drop a pack of cards, and it ends up as a, as, a, as a mess and not as a pack of cards anymore because it increases its entropy. So you get a balance of reducing energy and increasing, which is why it's negative, the entropy S. Well, when you have a material with lots of components, this gets a bit bigger and it begins to, it's more likely now to dominate over the energy of interaction between the atoms. So you don't get so many compounds forming. And you don't, and you get more of these large scale, multi-component, single phases. And that's why you get the structure that we, uh, that I've talked about. Now I'm going to talk for the last, uh, I've got two little sections to go. The first is about a couple of properties of Cantor alloys, which, uh, which look a little bit more at the atomic structure and how that influences some of the properties. And I'm going to explain this by looking at this uh, um, picture here, which is, um, which was written by uh, which was drawn by Murti and uh, and uh, yeah and Ranganathan in their book. It's not a real structure because it's a square lattice. It's not a real three-dimensional lattice, um, and it's a ten-component system and it's only drawn very schematically. So you've got ten different atoms designated A to J, and here they are sitting there. And I want to draw your attention to two things: the different types of local environment and the local strain in the in those different local environments. So let's deal with the first: the local environments. So of course, you know, if, so think about it, if this was pure copper on, in it, on its face centered cubic the lattice, every atom would be the same, they'd all be copper. If it was pure gold, they'd all be gold. If it was pure aluminium, they'd all be aluminium. Even if you've added to the nickel a little bit of aluminium, only one in a thousand atoms are, are aluminium. So pretty much every point in this structure is equivalent. They're all the same. Everyone is a copper atom or a nickel atom. Occasionally, maybe you've got one which is different, but most of them are exactly the same. In the Cantor alloy, or in any multi-component uh, uh, alloy, in any of the Cantor alloys, that's not true, of course, because there are more components. But it's more, it's it's a greater effect than that, because let's, it's not just that there's 10 different components here, because take this A atom, it's got near neighbours B, F, C and H, and second near neighbours E, C, F and B. But if you take a different uh, atom A, it's got different near neighbours and different second near neighbours. If you take another atom A, it's different again. So the local environments, there's lots and lots of them. I'll show you in a minute how many. It's an enormous number, it turns out to be. Um, but let's notice first that that difference in local environments produces a slight straining in the material. What do I mean by a straining? Well, these atoms are all different sizes and slightly different electronic structure. So the, the, so the, uh, the lattice is not so perfect. If you have a small A atom here, 
then they, they get squeezed in a bit. The others shrink in a little bit. If you get a large sea atom, then it pushes the others out. So there are small strains in the lattice throughout associated with this wide variation in local environments. Well, let's look at how many local environments there are first. If you do the combinatorial mass again, it turns out for a five component alloy like the original Cantor alloy, thinking of first and second near neighbors, there are 20 trillion different local environments. If you have a six component material, there are 600 trillion different environments. If you include third near neighbors, which sometimes have an impact on the properties of a material, um, you get to crazy numbers like 10 to the 30 and 10 to the 33. In other words, the number you need an enormous chunk of material to even give yourself a representative material. Two chunks of material are different because you can't have all that number of local environments in, 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 in you know, if, unless the material is very a very large piece of it. So there are literally trillions and trillions of these local environments, and they're all associated with a small strain. Well, the strain isn't actually that small, but the difference in size is. So here are the five. Cantor, uh, initial Cantor alloy elements. They have sizes which are quite similar, uh, ranging from 125 to 128 picometers. Um, and uh, the difference is three picometers. Even I can do that maths. Three picometers is the difference, but that's about two and a half percent. Two and a half percent in strain terms is quite a lot. So the lattice is locally strained as you move through it, as you, if you could walk through it, if you walk through it, it's locally strained by amounts varying up to two and a half percent. And that has massive impacts on some important properties. And I'm going to talk about two of them. The first is, uh, oh, sorry, let's let's just check whether 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 we're, we're on the right track with this amount of strain. Well, it's quite hard to measure those uh, those those, those local uh, deviations, but synchrotron X-ray diffraction gives an answer of 4.8 picometers and uh, neutron diffraction gives an answer of two picometers. So it's, it's about right. It's in the two to five picometer range, which is in the one to five percent strain range. A, a small it's sounding it is, but it's actually a lot in terms of the straining of a material. So I want to talk about two properties which are influenced by that. The first one is the diffusion and the, the, the rate at which atoms move around inside a material. So uh, those that aren't material scientists who are listening, if, if, if any have still stayed this, this far and uh, not been put off by the technical stuff, um, maybe may be surprised to know that atoms can move around inside a solid material, but they can. They don't move very fast and they move faster, a bit faster at high temperature. But that, that motion is responsible for a lot of the uh, degradation of materials um, under duress, under high temperature or under uh, ex corrosion. Uh, in, 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 in oxidation or corrosion environments, corrosive environments, or under radiation, and the and the atoms to move around. I'm not going to get into the details of how it happens for those uh, that aren't mater uh, material scientists, but um, uh, they squeeze effectively between the other atoms. They do it by a special uh, mechanism called vacancy diffusion. But we don't need to go into that. They basically have to squeeze through the existing lattice to move. And if you have those local strains everywhere, it's much harder for them to squeeze their way through. In technical language, vacancy uh, motion is constrained. The vacancies get stuck because they're stuck at positions of uh, where they're relieving the strain. Um, and this is shown here. This is shown. We normally uh, measure the, the speed of motion of uh, atoms by the diffusion coefficient, uh, and we usually plot it in uh, an inverse temperature, normalized. Uh, appropriately, and you can see here that the two uh, counter alloys here at the bottom, there are three counter alloys, have the lowest diffusion by about a half to an order of magnitude lower than some other comparable uh, um, uh, kinds of materials. So the rate of uh, motion of atoms is much slower. This means that they're resistant to degradation at high temperature, it means they're resistant to degradation by corrosion, and it means that they're resistant to degradation under radiation, ir irradiation. The next uh, um, property I want to mention in this context is the, uh, the, the deformation behavior, the, the way that the atoms can elongate and be stretched. And we've, we've already talked about that a little bit, but the mechanism by which that happens, I said, was that planes of atoms roll over each other, but they do that, of course, as the material scientists know, via the process, via the action of something called dislocations. The non-material scientists, you don't need to know what dislocations are, they're lines 
in the material. The, each of these lines here is a dislocation, and this is a picture of these dislocations in the uh, uh, in one of the Cantor alloys. Um, and these 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 uh, these lines of, uh, of of disorganization move around the material, and they cause the planes to roll over each other and the material to deform. And in, in face centered cubic materials, that's very easy. Dislocations are very easily created and very easily moved. That's why you get you can beat gold into gold foil or, 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 or lead can be easily beaten out or copper can be, uh, uh, you know, drawn into, into into long wires and so on and so forth. All that formability comes from uh, this ability of the atom planes to roll over each other is to do with the creation of these lines and their mo movement being so easy. And that's also what prevents them from fracturing because it, rather than fracture, they, they change shape under the action of the rather than form a crack. And um, now this picture is exactly what you would find if you uh, looked at the def deformation of pure single uh, crystal copper or pure single crystal gold. It looks exactly the same. It's plain as slip to use the technical language um, and at some point you begin to get a bit of cross slip, but um, uh, you know, those are the technical details. It doesn't really matter. It's very similar. So how come the strengths are so high in this single phase FCC material? Well, of course, I've given the game away because I've been talking about these local environments. If we have a dislocation line here, it gets held up by the locally strained regions. It's got to push its way through these different sized atoms in their local strain fields. And that is quite hard to do. So it still can be stretched and deformed and formed. So it's still got that wonderful ductility, got the wonderful malleability, it's got the wonderful resistance to fracture, but it does it at a much higher strength level because of the intrinsic difficulty of pushing the dislocations through the, um, through the, through the structure. Here's a complicated equation. Bill Curtin at uh, EPFL um, came up with the basic uh, maths to explain this. Uh, the strength is determined by the sum of three components. Um, this is this is the one which is the uh, the the uh, difficulty of pushing a dislocation through that those that strain field, which is now uh, the, at the local atomic level. That's a complicated expression. And then you have to add on to it two other much better known expressions. Uh, as the dislocations move around, they get in each other's way. So you get what's called work hardening, classic Taylor work hardening. And, and if there are different crystals, as you saw, there are more than one crystal, then the grain boundaries, the crystal boundaries get in the way, and you get a classic hall patch grain boundary effect. So the total uh, strength of the material, these are well known, this is exactly what you get in any material, but uh, this is the new one that's much stronger. Well, is this right? This idea is right. And uh, here it's shown, the, the black are the experimental results for the Cantor alloy, and for a, a modified, the original Cantor alloy and a modified Cantor alloy, and the red, uh, the red uh, dots are the um, are, are that theory that I've just shown you. And this this has now been demonstrated in quite a number of different materials. It has been shown to work also in BCC materials as well. So the basic idea. So so to put it into technical language, it's not the pile stress, and it's also not the work hardening. Although it's got great work hardening capability. But the high strength basically comes from the difficulty of pushing uh, dislocations through the lattice uh, because of the strain fields in the local uh, distorted lattice. So as a consequence, what are the uses uh, of counter alloys being and, and other high uh, uh, entropy multi-component alloys being pursued? Well, already counter alloys have the best low temperature mechanical properties. Uh, they're being looked at for cryogenic purposes. They also have outstanding high temperature properties and they're very temperate, thermally resistant, but the BCC Senkoff alloys are even better and they're being looked at very strongly. Um, they're being looked at for corrosion and radiation damage resistance because they, um, they, they don't suffer problems because the uh, atoms can't move under the uh, 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 impact of the, corro the corrosive forces and the radiative forces. Um, other kinds of um, non-metals, uh, oxides and borides and so on, Functional materials are being looked at, multi-component ones, for other functional purposes. Two examples here, solar energy conversion and superconductors. And we have started at Brunel, and so have a few other people, uh, studies of recycling. Because if we're going to recycle our metals, and we absolutely have to recycle all our metals better, uh, we have to, and reuse them, we have to be able to melt them together, and the impurity levels go up, and at the moment they're becoming unusable. So we need to find multi-component alloys which we can use so that we can uh, remelt 
all of our existing uh, materials because we can't keep digging it up out of the ground and, uh, and, and smelting new material because it's far altogether too energy intensive. So those are some of the uses that are being looked at. I'm going to finish with a sequence of two or three slides, which uh, I discovered quite by accident when I was vice chancellor at the University of York. My head of chemistry was a man called, there was a man called Paul Walton. Well, he wasn't head of chemistry at first. I appointed him head of chemistry halfway through my time. A very good, able young uh, chemist. Um, and um, he, he, was a, a, he, he used to study in his research the influence of metals on, um, uh, on the body. Um, the chemical impact of metals within the body. Um, but he was a wonderful lecturer to uh, children. And I uh, had the pleasure of attending one of his lectures to children one day. Um, and I saw this sequence of, of, uh, of slides and I said, I must use this for my lecture on multi-component alloys. So he would show children, this would be said typically school children, maybe middle school children, uh, uh, maybe nine, 10, 11, 12, that sort of age. And he'd show them this slide and he'd say, who knows what material this is? And uh, a lot of the children might have come across uh, this and they would put their hands up and they say, please, sir, we know what this is. It's carbon. And he'd say, yes, you're right. It's carbon. And then he'd say, here's a slightly harder one. He said, who knows what material this is? And uh, still quite a few of them probably have come across at that age uh, water and they put their hands up and say, please, sir, yes, we know that's water. It's a material, it's a liquid material at room temperature, an important one. And he'd say, yes, you're right. He said, well, now I'm going to give you a, a slightly harder one again. He said, what's this material? And, um, well, I've given the game away. They didn't know, of course. I put it up on the right uh, here. It's the secret of life. This is the composition of your body. And it's the composition, actually, of everybody's body. And it's actually the composition of pretty much every mammal. Um, this is a very precise composition as well. Um, every one of these elements is needed in the in the body and it is needed in this amount. And if you have more or less, you don't survive. So to take the most obvious extreme example, selenium. That's about one atom in a billion is selenium. If you have two atoms in a billion, you die. And if you have one atom in, in uh, sorry, if you have two atoms in a billion, you die. And if you have two atoms in, uh, uh, in, in uh, if you have one atom in two billion, you die. And if you have two atoms in a billion, you die. It's got to be one atom in a billion or whatever that actually is. This is a very precise composition. Selenium has to be at that level. Cobalt has to be at that level, silicon and so on. So if you imagine that multi-component phase space picture I've mentioned one from time to time, the multi-pointed uh, polyhedron within which every single possible material is contained, it might be 60 components or 80 components or even more conservatively 40 components, there are literally 10 to the 100 different points in there or 10 to the 40 if you want to be more, more conservative or actually probably more like 10 to the 200 because there are really more components. All those points, one of those points is this one and it's got some pretty wonderful properties. It's the properties of life. Now, my contention is as if you, that most of these materials in multi-component space have not been looked at. There are a lot of other very, very special points yet to be found. There's a lot of other uh, wonderful regions to be found with exciting properties and really special points with very special materials. So to conclude, my first three take home messages uh, are my conclusions. Human history is the history of uh, materials and the development of materials. Uh, all materials are made up by mixing all the materials, uh, components, we call them alloys. And um, there are gazillions of materials. I hope I persuaded you of that. And there's a slight corollary as a fourth point. Many of those are going to be wonderful new materials with wonderful, exciting new properties, which can help underpin further wonderful developments of technology uh, as humankind develops further into the 21st century and beyond. So with that, I will say thank you very much. And that's my conclusion. Thank you, Professor Kanta, for the wonderful lecture. And uh, yeah, we don't have a reaction, uh, reaction tag. In this. We have a lot of claps. Um, so uh, the way we are going to go about this question answer session is that uh, people can raise hands and then I can just go over what they do and uh, you can Ask your ask your question to Professor Cantor. All right. Okay. So first one is from B N Acharya. 
yes prof yes dr acharya go ahead uh, you need to unmute yourself dr acharya sorry i have no question uh, it was a mistake sorry okay, go ahead great okay uh, dr raghunath sorry uh, that was a wonderful lecture professor i just want to know about uh, manufacturing of these complex tantal alloy because you, you said the structure is as simple as a very many common metal but what about producing them producing yeah. in quantities and so on yeah that's a very good question and i th i personally think uh, that i we can't prove it why is it people never looked at these multi-component materials before i personally think it's because if you if you're anyone who's done any casting and most uh, materials are made by melting uh, first and then and then cooling down some form of casting if you start to add too much of any component or if you start to add extra components you tend to find the material gets harder to cast it's that difficulty of manufacturing which i think put people off really adding any more than they needed to and, and probably it was a, a sort of um you know least least done uh, idea too you know there's no need to add anything else so why 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 not why you know let's concentrate on the things which we need to add because we want to add a particular property um but that's what I put down uh, people's uh, lack of ambition in looking at uh, multi-component systems and why everyone said to me and indeed to Jin Wei Ye that we were uh, uh, crazy to be studying these materials. Well, it turns out, as I said, that actually they're not that bad to manufacture. The counter alloy is very easy to manufacture. It's not like, uh, so, you know, I worked for many years on rapid solidification, which is a way of making new materials. I've worked on uh, vapor deposition, which is a way of making new materials. People are are doing severe plastic deformation to make new materials. There's lots of, of wonderful ways of making new materials. People are uh, inventing, uh, uh, you know, fantastic uh, carbon nanotube related materials, composites. These are all very difficult materials to make. Um, counter alloy, is, the counter alloys are easy to make. You put them into a pot, you melt them, they melt very nicely, and you can cast them very easily. They're very castable because they're ductile. And um, once you get into those regions, Whereas you're in the single phase regions, the materials become just like the single phase pure components, just the, the same reason, you know, they're not inclined to fracture because they're in a single phase structure, which has a lot of capability to absorb uh, stresses. What normally happens with, with castings, as you add more components, you start to get more compounds forming, which are, which are, are uh, a high hardness and, and strong and as they begin to solidify they pull each other apart because of the stresses as you're forming the material whether you whether you're casting them or whether you're um whether you're forging them whichever it is whether you're working them whether you're rolling them all those sorts of things well these multi-component materials are actually quite easy to do all that because they've got the intrinsic ability with the single phase structure so uh, they're actually pretty easy to make but if you look at all multi-component alloys it's a bit like um, like anything. Some are good, some are bad. Some are single phase and are easy to make. Some are multi phase and 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 uh, like the ones that uh, we found when we just added, you know, without trying very hard, uh, a bit too much of something, we found that they were quite hard to make. Yes, if you're going to the wrong bit of uh, multi component phase space, the first thing it's very hard for people to get their heads around it. It's so big that you can find everything. You can find anything. You can find a whole bunch of stuff we don't haven't even dreamed of. I think, and people are always asking me, you know, can we come up with a theory to explain when we get this or when we get that? And I say, well, no, because we haven't even mapped out the territory yet. It's very hard to do it. So manufacturability very important, but it turns out that the intrinsic view that multi-component materials will be hard to make turns out to be wrong. In many cases, they're actually quite easy to make, uh, and uh, that's a big advantage of them. And um, that's why, that's one of the reasons people have jumped into studying them so easily. You know, it, it's a guaranteed PhD project. You know, you've got a million, million, billion different materials you can pick, and you're probably guaranteed, if you pick one at random that's not been studied before, to find something interesting and something's not been discovered before. How, how important it would be for humankind, who knows? But that's true of a lot of research. We have to keep researching before we really find the major advances. But um, uh, there's an awful lot of studying it to be done. Great, simple exploratory science. But there's a good chance you, you'll be able to make the materials quite well. Good question. <laughs>
Thank you, sir. Who else wants to ask a question? Hello? Abhik, you have to unmute yourself. Please unmute, Abhik ji. I am unmuted. Okay, sorry. Uh, Muni Kumar, can you go ahead with your question? Muni Kumar? Yes, sir. Is it audible, sir? Yeah, you have to speak a bit louder. Uh, we are yes, sir. just faintly hitting yes. here. Yes sir. yes, sir. Thank you for wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, sir, I have a small question. We have mixed up a uh, lot of metals in the high entropy alloys, and uh, will the bonding nature will change after making alloy? So how how it yeah. will deviate from the metallic bonding? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, once again, <laughs> yeah, the, the, a bit like the last question. The answer is kind of yes and no. Uh, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Um, I mean, what we didn't know was that. Um, let's let's take let's take things like the counter alloys. The counter alloys are actually a rather limited range chemically. So the the things that will dissolve to make a face centered cubic structure, um, a single phase face centered cubic. Structure. And by the way, people have made them now up to eight or nine or ten different components. Maybe not equiatomic, but still with a lot of different components. Um, but if you if you expand the chemical range too much, the chemical energy forces start to dominate again, and the entropy isn't sufficient to uh, keep the material as a, a single phase. But what we hadn't realized uh, until um, our discovery and Jin Wei Ye's uh, hypothesis about high entropy, um, what we what we didn't realize before was that if you mix a lot of different components with similar chemistry. So, that, you know, the, the counter alloys, they're middle to late transition metals. You can add chromium, manganese, the, the, the chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, together with some of the next transition uh, series down, you know, things like palladium and platinum. People haven't added much gold, but I may I imagine gold would also dissolve into it. It's too expensive. Um, you know, and one or two, two, two of the other ones at the end of the, of the transition series. They are all intrinsically FCC. They mix together very well. They mix much better as a multi-component material than they do in the binaries of those, by the way, where they don't always mix so well. Somehow it gets better, but it's because of this uh, multi-component entropy. Within that range, the entropy is dominating over those chemical energy forces. But it, the minute you start to add in things like vanadium, let's say, which is a bit chemically dis different because it's at the beginning of the transition series, or if you add too much aluminium, you can add about... Uh, uh, five or ten percent aluminium and it stays uh, face centered cubic. But if you add too much aluminium, you start to find compound formation. You start to form aluminides or you start to form uh, uh, um, other compounds. So you can, if you choose chemically different things, and start, and if you start adding more stronger chemical uh, compound formers like boron or carbon or nitrogen, then you start to get the chemical bonding effects and you start to make multi. You start to get multi-component, multi-phase materials, which are a mixture of face-centered cubic and borides, or face-centered cubic plus sigma phase, or those sorts of things. If you add enough, though, you get a multi-component boride. So there's a, you know, imagine in that multi-component phase space, there's a whole region of FCC uh, counter alloys, and then some way over in a different region, there's a whole region of multi-component mm. boride, which has um, Boron on the sublattice, um, you can imagine a sort of cesium chloride lattice, and boron uh, at every single uh, body center. And the uh, the other sublattice, though, is a, is a random distribution of five or six or seven different transition metal components. And, and there's an enormous region of, of, of multi component mono carbo nitro borides. Um, and there's another one of spinels. So you start to get, as I say, these regions in between their multi phase. So you can see how it's working. There's this balance between the entropy and the uh, chemical interaction energy. And sometimes in the in, in between these big single phase regions, the energy interactions are dominating and you're starting to get these uh, these compounds forming. There is there is an effect which I'll mention, which is not what you asked about, but I, but I love the, the idea of it, which has it's what I call the Sherlock Holmes effect. I'm just writing a book on, on, on this has never been no, no one's ever heard me use this phrase before. I've only just invented it um, I call it the Sherlock Holmes effect. I'm writing a book on multi alloys and it'll be my, the first uh, 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 large scale use of it. 
So in all other cases where we have discovered new materials, we've discovered new compounds. Rapid solidification, vapor deposition, severe plastic deformation, you know, all the different things we can do to make new materials. We find if we use these new processing methods, we get uh, uh, new compounds. You don't get new compounds when you go into the multi-component phase, component phase space. It's what I call the dog that didn't bark. Nobody's commented on it because they haven't noticed that the dog didn't bark. We don't find new compounds. We What we get is the same compounds, but multi-componented up with a range of different co uh, components on the same sublattices. You get the same rock salt. There's a great big area of rock salt structure, sodium chloride. There's a great big area of uh, cesium chloride structure. There's a, uh, the, the, and so on and so forth. Things that we thought were line compounds suddenly become great regions because you can uh, um, uh, uh, populate one of the sublattices with lots of different multi-component similar chemical versions. So th that, that, that's kind of what happens. And I, I call that the, I, I think I'm going to call that the Sherlock Holmes effect, the dog that didn't bark. We don't find new compounds. You might say, why don't we? And I think it's something to do with the fact that we live in a three-dimensional world and there's only a limited number of ways. You, you can't have a compound with 15 different, 10 or 15 different sublattices. There's just, there aren't organizational ways of doing it in a three in a three dimensional world. And there have been actually some studies of that kind of thing. But anyway, there, there you go. And um, the answer to your question is, the chemical energy does dominate in some regions, but on the whole, the entropy effect is bigger than it is in binary and ternary systems. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Arvind Kumar. Uh, Arvind Sinha, sorry. You're muted. Please unmute Arvind, sir. Arvind, Please Arvind, unmute Arvind. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kenter, for the nice talk on the high entropy alloy. I have only one question. Are there any report on multi on biocompatible and biodegradable multi-component alloy? Because we want to solve the high degradation rate of the magnesium-based alloys. That's a great question. And I have to say, uh, my favorite question is the ones where I don't know the answer. So I have to be perfectly honest. I have I do not know of any report about that. But I, you know, there's there's thousands of papers being written. I have not read all the papers on multi-component alloys. There's just too many for me to keep up with. I've only kept up with in some areas. Uh, I would I wouldn't be surprised if there have been some studies already, but there won't be very many. It's certainly not been a big a big topic. Um, but it's a very interesting idea. Um, people I mean look the a lot of the early in the in the in the early 2010s and uh, up until only the last two or three years actually most of the excitement was about this finding the canter alloy with uh, this single phase fcc and, and that's understandable it's a very exciting a very surprising feature and it and the uh, and one of the nice things for material scientists is it, it's got lots of properties which are quite similar to properties we're familiar with because it's a very simple structure but it's got sort of wonderfully different, slightly different uh, effects. So people have loved studying it and, and they discover it's very easy. To, they're very easy to make. And so a lot of the work is concentrated on the cancer alloys and then on the Senkoff BCC alloys. We're beginning to look at some others. Um, but uh, the real revolution of this field is not actually that. That's an exciting discovery, but it's and it's a big discovery and there's some potentially wonderful things to, to be done with it. But the real the real discovery is just the massive, massive uh, uh, scale of multi-component phase space and, the, and the, the massive number of materials that can be made, just way beyond the mind's imagination. And, you know, uh, um, and what it means is that people are now beginning to sort of try, it, it's, it's a different philosophy to, to, make, to try to find new materials. You know, most of our work in finding new materials for material scientists has been in using the same materials and finding ever cleverer ways to manipulate them. And we're very good at that. We do f wonderful things, thermomechanical processing and casting and all that kind of thing. And we can change the properties of individual materials an awful lot. And microstructure of a material is very important. It's, it still is in multi-component materials. But suddenly our palette has become enormous. And I'll tell you a, a little story. Uh, Alan Cottrell, um, 
in his, in it, towards the end of his life, used to go around giving a lecture called Shocks in Material Science. Um, you know, the father of uh, material science, the father of metallurgy, um, uh, Alan Cottrell, um, in his 80s, was giving a talk called The Shocks in Material Science. He, he came and gave it at, at Oxford when I was head of department there. And um, what he said was, he said, you know, he said materials is a wonderful field because we keep finding new things. You know, we suddenly discover uh, the, 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 the ductile brittle transition in the 1950s. We suddenly discover um, uh, um, super plasticity in the 1970s or 60s, whenever it was. We suddenly discover superconductivity. We suddenly discover quasi crystals. He said, we don't know why this happens, but every so often we come across something uh, very unusual in material. People, uh, sometimes it's things that people say couldn't be done and we discover it can be done, but it's often things we just never knew could, could have existed we didn't believe were possible. Um, and he talked about all these different uh, uh, developments and it was his way of discussing the development of materials. I think I now know why we get so many shocks. Every so often people bumble into multi-components phase space and find something interesting. It's pretty much what I did, you know. I love, by the way, the, the irony. How, you know, I, I, I'm writing my, uh, uh, this book about multi-component uh, uh, alloys and materials. And I'm including a history of how they were discovered, you know, and I've written this. I've said I would love to have discovered multi-component alloys by some wonderful, exciting, theoretical, uh, you know, basic fundamental theory which predicted this. I would have loved to have done it by some incredibly insightful experiment. I didn't. I just had a bit of a random idea as I was walking in and out of the department or something like that. It happened serendipitously. It happened by random. I love the idea that high entropy materials, random materials, with randomness is important, were discovered by serendipity, i.e. randomness and entropy in human behaviour. So I quite like that, to be honest. And I'm a big fan of randomness and exploratory science. And there, is, there are continents and continents and stars to be found in multi-component phase space. And we, can, we need to go out there and explore and plant flags and discover new materials. And I'm sure there's going to be some interesting biocompatible materials to be found too. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Uh, Ayan Rakshit. Ayan, just go ahead with your question. Um, am I audible now? Uh, yes. yes. No. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question which I think you have discussed in these questions. Um, so uh, can we have a single phase uh, multi-component alloy uh, which is uh, stabilized uh, not by the entropy but by like say low enthalpy of formation? So in a way you have agglomerations of atoms which are not big enough to nucleate into different phases but uh, so they're not stabilized by the entropy, but they are stabilized by some other way. Is that um, a likely thing to that is possible or is it quite unlikely? Um, no, uh, no, I think what you say, no, it, I probably haven't described it quite as carefully as I should have done. If you have a multi-component material with a single structure, there just is a, quite a high entropy of mixing that, you know, you. That, that 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 just happens to be the case. If you know, if if atoms are distributed randomly on a sublattice, on on a, on a lattice, or a sublattice, so if it's FCC, it's the whole lattice. If it's a multi-component boride, um, then it's the sublattice, the metal sublattice. Um, if it's a spinel, then it's uh, it would be on one of the two metal sublattices in the in the spinel structure. Um, so because of that randomness of distribution, it seems that in multi-component, uh, uh, when you go to a multi-component phase space, uh, these compounds will allow that to happen because as long as the atoms which are, are being distributed on the sublattice are not too different chemically, then, uh, you know, they can replace each other in this way and they get the gain of the multi-component entropy, the extra uh, uh, configurational entropy by randomizing, by having a more random structure. Now, they may still also have a low energy of compound formation. So, you know, the, the, the free energy is determined by a combination of the energy of interaction and the entropy of randomization. So um, if you have FCC, uh, the FCC counter alloys, uh, 
um, there isn't a high degree of chemical interaction energy, and they are dominated by the um, by the uh, by the entropy of randomizing because you've got an awful random awfully randomized structure. If you have a boride, though, the co the energy of the boride formation has produced that two lat two sublattice boride structure, which is chemically uh, covalently compact, uh, covalently bonded between the boron atoms and the and and the metal atoms. But the metal atoms can be a wide variety of different metal atoms. So you kind of get both. You've got the low interaction energies, and you've got the uh, randomizing of the uh, of the metal atoms on the sublattice. And by the way, in that case, you can have randomizing on the other sublattice because you can randomize boron, nitrogen, and carbon on the on the second sublattice. So um, it's a slightly more complicated that balance. But in broad terms, the uh, the configuration entropy. Um, tends to stabilize the single phase and the uh, chemical energy tends to stabilize compounds but sometimes the compounds themselves can be multi-component um, but sometimes they can't and uh, they don't absorb lots of different components and you end up with a multi-phase material with lots of compounds which is a bit like the first alloy we made that 20 component alloy that was a whole bunch of different compounds mixed together which therefore ended up being very very uh, brittle and uh, pretty much a waste of time, except it was the world record for a while. I couldn't get it in the Guinness Book of World Records, unfortunately. But anyway, another another interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, call Shiladitya. Uh, I think Shiladitya is the name. Shiladit, Dr. Shiladitya or Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul, go okay. ahead with your question. Brian, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Brian, I think we we discussed this uh, some time ago. The, could you explain a little bit more on the on the philosophy behind the selection process? Because I think we we discussed, and I was talking about yeah. Yeah. you know use of critical raw materials and things like that. So I mean, if somebody wants to really start from from zero, where do you think they should start from, and and what should be the strategy behind development of these alloy systems? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, Paul uh, uh, or Sheila, as I, I know you like to be called, thanks a lot uh, for that, and uh, good to see you, by the way, again. Um, well, look, uh, you know, I spent the last uh, 20 years um, as a university administrator uh, and as a, a vice chancellor. And, and, and as a vice chancellor, the one thing you have to learn about is strategy, because the one thing you do do is you develop a strategy. Um, my good friend Brian Smith, who was a, a chemist, who was uh, the vice chancellor of Cardiff. Got a phone going. So uh, once said that uh, to me, he said, "You know, vice chancellors. He said the most important attribute is to be able to sit there when someone comes up with a good idea, and you and you stroke your your uh, your uh, uh, incipient beard a little bit, your chin, and you say, and you look at them, and you and you look very thoughtful, and you say, yes, good idea. That's what the job of a vice chancellor is to do. Um, it's very important to." Because, you know, on the whole, you've got a, a bunch of wonderful colleagues with fantastic ideas. And the basic basic object of uh, leading is to make sure you don't get in the way and that you help support them. But the truth is that there is actually a strategy is very important for an organization. Um, and anyone who's dealt with, and that's the one thing a vice chancellor does have to do, has to decide what kind of a university you want to be. If you don't know what kind of a university you want to be, you can't really run one because it's a mess. You're doing different things which get in each other's way. That's So strategy is about deciding what you want to do. So the strategy, which is the precise question you ask, for going about exploring multi-component space depends upon what you want to achieve. The first thing is to define what do you want to achieve, and different people want to achieve different things. So I'll give you some different examples. Alan Vincent wanted to get his degree, and he was happy to do any uh, any study that uh, you know didn't uh, stress him too much thinking, wasn't too theoretical, um, and where, he, where, where there was a reasonable chance of doing something which was, you know, to, he had to, his, for his dissertation, do something which was new. And this was guaranteed in this case, so it suited him perfectly. It didn't really matter what alloy he made up. And I was trying to explore an idea, and I had no idea how to go about it. So, again, it, it was so, so we could use the strategy which I call parachuting in. Um, so, it, it, pure exploration. We just said, here's a new. A new world. We didn't know how big it was then, but we knew there was a big world of possibility. 
So we said, how the hell do we decide what to do? So we just picked something and did it. Now that is a very trial and error approach and it has its disadvantages. And we, what we found initially was not very uh, encouraging until, uh, well, actually very quickly, we found the counter oil. So it worked very, very well in the end. So if you do that exploratory approach, when there's enough of a, a sort of a unknown continent out there, you have a good chance of finding something interesting, but you, you, that's not directed. What you find interesting might not be what you were looking for. Well, you weren't looking for it. But, so if you're not looking for anything special, you just want to publish a new paper or you just want to find something interesting or you just want to get your, you know, get, get a dissertation done, then uh, pure trial and error is perfectly good. If, however, you want to discover a particular kind of material, it gets a little bit more difficult. Um, but that's why uh, we invented quite early something called equiatomic substitution. And I've used this, uh, I've, talk, uh, I've talked about this without actually using the phrase so far. So with equiatomic substitution, because we thought about it, this is in the early days, and we said, well, you know, how can we go about this a bit more strategically? So we thought, well, you take a material of, of, of known interest and you take one of the components of that material and you can add several components of the same chemistry to that by substituting for that component. So I've already talked about that with something like the, the spinels. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I can give you another example. The, the monoaluminides, uh, which are things like nickel aluminide, NIAL, uh, cobalt aluminide, COAL, and uh, iron aluminide, uh, FEAL, um, they're all um, quite narrowly defined compositions. They have a slight range of composition. Um, they are compounds which have um, a cesium chloride structure. Uh, they're an ordered B or an ordered BCC structure. Um, and there's been quite a lot of interest in them uh, in the past as potential air improved aero engine materials, but they're too brittle. Now they're being studied uh, fantastically intensively because it turns out you can use this equiatomic substitution. There is a great patch in multi-component phase space of multi-component monoaluminide. So imagine a bracket and inside the bracket is iron, cobalt, nickel, chromium, manganese, uh, vanadium, titanium, you name it, transition metals, close brackets, aluminium, aluminide. So if you have a one-to-one -one ratio of the transition metal components to aluminium, you find it's got a single phase structure very often. It's got the B2 structure, the cesium chloride structure, and it turns out to have some absolutely outstanding properties. Um, and people are looking at that very hard. So another way of exploring is to, uh, is to start with a material you're kind of interested in, which you know, you know, it, it, uh, you know, might have been a good candidate for something you're interested in, but isn't, you know, as good as you'd like. And you can begin to explore multi-component phase space that way. But there are other other processes and um, uh, people are using um, uh, to, if, if, if they decide they want to find a particular kind of phase or phase structure, they're saying to themselves, well, I want to find an FCC material which is going to be strengthened by the carbide particles, a bit like what happens with the steels, you know, that the, the semen type particles strengthen the iron steel. So can, can, can we design a, a material like that? So, well, they then say, well, let me use thermodynamic calculations to do that, because thermodynamic calculations can give me an idea whether I've got the kind of phase structure predicted, which would produce that sort of material. And um, there are there are limits to that, unfortunately, and the limits to that are because you're beginning now to use theory. And the problem is it requires a the theory to be right, underlying the thermodynamic calculations, and b the parameters you put in the, the, the exact details for each each particular case to be known as well. And the truth is, in most of multi-component phase space, we just don't know those. The theories don't work probably, um, just like the dislocation behavior theory didn't didn't work out to be changed, um, and the uh, and and we certainly don't know, the, don't know the parameters. So unless you already know quite a bit about that region of space. The thermodynamic uh, predictions don't work very well. The same applies to first principles calculations. Some people are trying to predict properties and, and, and structures for using first principles calculations, but the same issues arise because first principles calculations rely on theories which are which are which which were developed for dilute uh, two com one or two component systems and don't extrapolate into multi-component concentrated systems, and we don't know the parameters anyway, so it, they don't they, we can't do it very accurately. And then other people are using artificial intelligence methods 
to uh, predict uh, structures that they've decided they want and properties they've decided they want. And once again, the, you know, uh, just like um, thermodynamic calculations or first principles calculations, AI type methods um, uh, are really a form of interpolation. You need to have some knowledge already and you can then use AI to kind of predict, uh, you know, within that where you might be best, uh, best prospect for, for alternative improved properties. But nevertheless, people have had some success with using these methods. Now, there's a, I, want, I want to mention one last one, uh, uh, Shiloh, because uh, if you'll let me, because the, the way you talked about it, critical materials. If you have a particular application in mind, then there will be some constraints. I mean, we had the question about biocompatibility. We know there are some elements that just don't go in the body because they react badly with the body. The same is true. You know, you can talk to to, to uh, people um, who make aero engines, and there's some elements they will not let you even consider putting into an aero engine alloy because they know that it, you know, it, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it just reacts awfully inside an aero engine in that kind of environment. If we want to not use critical metals, we might want to rule them out. So we might also limit our palate to some extent because of existing knowledge before we begin to decide whether to use trial and error, uh, equiatomic substitution. AI and so on and so forth. But there are many strategies now for looking into multi-component phase space. The truth is, in the end, you have to do a, a certain amount of trial and error. And, and, and you might think, you know, how is it if it's so vast that we were so lucky with our trial and error to discover um, the Cantor alloy first off? Well, actually, it turns out, of course, that nature helps you. Because if you just pick any old material at random, it will be, then be composed of a series of other materials inside it. And some of those might be interesting. So it kind of uh, boils out into some other materials. It tells you what's around in the vicinity of that bit of multi-component phase space. That's what happened. We didn't make the cantor alloy. We made something completely different. But the cantor alloy was in there and we, and we spotted it because we made up an alloy which was not too far from having a cantor alloy, if you saw what I mean. So, you know, I, I say to people, use all these aids and, and strategies to try and find new materials, but also be an explorer, you know, put on your pith helmet, go out there, find things. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Uh, Francesco and we, we have been discussing the meeting we, uh, we had with you, so I'll, I'll come, back to, come back to you with, with our thoughts. Thanks. Look forward to it, look forward to it. Uh, so we'll have the last question, Brian. Uh, so okay. So, Dr. Manikandan. Um, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, yeah. uh, uh, thank you, Professor Brian, uh, for your uh, wonderful lecture. And I have, uh, uh, okay, uh, basically two questions. Okay. Uh, one is uh, how about the uh, corrosion resistance in atomic oxygen environment? The uh, basic of basis for this uh, question is uh, normally we use multilayer insulation for the uh, our satellites in the uh, lower earth orbit so yeah. uh, okay it, uh, even though it uh, resists the uh, tox corrosion but still there are certain problems so uh, it will lead to corrosion so whether uh, this cantor alloys can be explored for tox application that is atomic oxygen corrosion application and my second query is uh, when uh, can it be because yeah. we have, yes. Yeah, we have uh, okay uh, low temperature properties as well as high temperature properties of this alloy. Can it be used for the realization or fabrication of the rocket engines? In such case, uh, can we uh, 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 weld that join the alloys using conventional uh, gas tension or welding? Because the complexity in the shapes, if you consider, so we may have to necessarily go for gas tension or welding. Whereas in the other cases, we can go for definitely, yes, electron beam welding or solid state welding process. So, <clears throat> OK, yeah. uh, well, I can answer your questions quite quickly because you, you've given two really interesting areas um, where I, the truth is I don't know the answer. So I, <laughs> I have to own up. Uh, I don't know the answer. So um, but but two very quick comments, though. Um, yeah, corrosion. Um, the it, the cantor alloy itself is quite corrosion resistant, but it depends upon the corrosive environment, you know, um, not uh, as simple as, as, as just saying, oh, it's a wonderful corrosion resistant material. There's an end of message. We can use it. But it does have uh, quite good corrosion resistance in certain environments. I don't know the details 
because I have not kept up with that area. I say I'm writing a book on it. I will probably be researching that in the next month or two to, to try and put in a bit more about it into my book than I currently know. But it's not my my area, I have to say. So uh, I think I just have to direct you to uh, some of the there are reviews now of corrosion resistance in um, in multi component uh, materials. And um, so I think it's possible to to look into what's been done um, and the welding. There has been not much work done on welding either. And that's a really good question because welding weldability is a really important property for any real usable material. I'm sure people must have studied it. I can't remember any paper that I've read about it. But once again, it's not one of those things that I've tried to keep up with. I probably should have. You've reminded me. Thank you very much that I ought to look into the well, the welding, because it's a very interesting question. Um, as far as I, I mean, in principle, they ought to be uh, weldable because in the same way as they're quite easily, to, they're quite easy to melt and, and quite castable. Having said that, um, you know, there may well be uh, problems with some of the components because they may react badly under the specific uh, in instances that are, you know, depending on the kind of welding you're using. If you use uh, TIG welding, you know, it, it's to do with the, the, you know, the details of what happens during the TIG welding or during uh, one of the other, pro or the MIG welding. So the, the truth is, I don't know the answer, but a very interesting points. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, so so uh, so I'll just deliver the vote of thanks now. Uh, so thanks, Professor Cantor, for accepting our invitation and delivering this uh, uh, this uh, P. Ramachandran our lecture. Um, it was a pleasure and it was an honor for us to hear you. You gave us a long lecture and uh, answered a long a lot of questions in a very exhaustive manner. So thank you for that. I also want to thank um, uh, Vikram for uh, Vikram and Satyam for um, introducing the guests and uh, and uh, taking care of the honorees. Uh, and then I want to uh, thank my co-organizers, uh, Dr. Arvind Sinha from Animal and uh, the NP Gandhi Memorial Trust, uh, which is also part of uh, uh, Department of Metallurgy, IIT BHU, and uh, the, uh, the, my peers at uh, I, uh, Indian Institute of Science uh, for co-organizing this lecture so that it went off in a very nice fashion. We had over 270 participants, so it was well attended and uh, well, it was well received. So thank you all for attending this lecture and uh, it was a great it was great fun so thanks everybody and keep working thank you all for attending thank you so much thank you bye bye now. thank you brian that's a good lecture thanks a lot thank, yeah. you. Bye. thank you very much nice occasion. good to see you all thank you all so much for attending eh? it's a great pleasure